Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum again everyone. Um, so last week, uh, actually I'll start from the beginning. We're studying the 29th word. Um, this treatise is about angels, the um, immortality of spirit and resurrection. So um, this is, I think, our 30th week, <laughs> alhamdulillah, um, hoping that uh, it has made a noticeable impact in your lives as it has in mine. Um, so in the second aim, we have been looking more into uh, resurrection, the necessity for resurrection, proofs for resurrection. And uh, we've been looking at um, some parts of that, uh, is it possible? Is it sure to happen? Uh, is the one who is going to bring it about, um, does he have enough power? Um, how do we know that, um, it will happen? How will it happen? Um, so these are the questions that we started with and we're trying to answer. Uh, last week we read the second matter and the third fundamental point, um, about divine power. Um, and this week we will read the third matter, inshallah. Um, as a reminder in the beginning of Halakha, um, one thing that, you know, we keep coming back to and reminding ourselves is um, how we should look at the text and how we should look at the Halakha. Um, so obviously the text is... Um, it's not a walk in the park. It's not um, a beach read. So it's definitely requiring more effort on our end to well, understand it, to practice it. Um, but it's also teaching us how to read the Quran so that we can get guidance from the Quran. Um, so it's kind of uh, paving the way way or showing us uh, an example of how it's been done in the past um, so if we look at it that way then I think we can benefit more from it inshallah um, okay so uh, another point I'll make from last week's halakha, I think is um, one part that we read and we really talked about was, um, so in, in the second matter, we talked about divine power being related to the interface of things, the medakut aspect of uh, creation. And we're looking at uh, the mulk, aspect and malakut aspect which has been kind of our study with the 29th word um and uh another thing that we focus with receiving nur is realizing our need for connection with the malakut aspect of creation so um realizing that um a lot of the needs i have uh the concerns i have the uh challenges i have in life are signs for me to seek this interface of things uh, so inshallah we can keep reading to learn that practice and i'll leave it at that for me uh, if anyone would like to share any takeaways from last week or any reflections throughout the week please go ahead and then we can start reading the third matter inshallah I think uh, I was reflecting on uh, one of my orchids, which had uh, dried up and it was almost woody. And I, I, I was giving up hope on that. And subhanAllah, just uh, to see a new offshoot from a dried woody, like almost dead, <laughs> was a reflection of his promise of resurrection, you know, if Allah mm -hmm. wants anything can like it's it's uh, his uh, power is not limited to just universe and big things 
but the smallest of thing which we maybe give up hope on or we uh, uh, or we attest uh, reasons and as pop to it like oh I didn't water it or I didn't, didn't get sufficient humidity or sunlight so we start connecting on a horizontal level but uh, the malakut side of it is intact and it's acting even when we don't notice it you know so last halakha was like uh, the the sentence in it that uh, to from a blooming of a flower to the spring like everything is in his hand and he has uh, appointed angels for each and every act so that was something i reflected on thank you ziba yeah i think that especially in the third fundamental point we're seeing this um but in in this part that we've started reading, um, yeah, so we're looking at, you know, divine power and the absoluteness of it. And it's, I think for us, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around it just because for us, everything is in scale. Um, you know, last week we said that um, the external face of creation, the mook, is the arena of opposites. It's where matters like beautiful and ugly, good and evil, big and small, difficult and easy appear. This is our day-to-day -day life, our everyday experience. So when we're thinking about um, the resurrection of a single flower on a, a pot of just like random plant uh, versus thinking of resurrection of the whole world or the entire spring it's hard to imagine uh, that it's the same ease same um, level of effort which is really no effort right um, so I think it's it's nice to reflect on the small things and the big things even though for us it's small and big but um, in reality there is no comparison it's the same the small flower uh, that is on the corner of my house, my living room, it's just, it's the same as the entire spring coming back to life, which is just, uh, like Dr. Yamina says, makes you want to go prostrate, which is amazing. Uh, any other reflections? Okay, if not, we'll start the third matter. Um, Bismillah. Third matter, divine power's relation is according to laws. This is to say, it regards many and few, great and small, as the same. We shall make this abstruse matter easier to understand with a number of comparisons. In the universe, transparency, reciprocity, balance, order, disengagedness, and obedience are all matters which render many equal to few and great equal to small. Okay. Um, so we're going to see, um, I think, two, four, six comparisons. Um, which should make it a little bit easier for us to understand how the creation of one thing and the creation of everything or a lot of things um, can be equal in this regard. Well, inshallah. First comparison, this explains the mystery of transparency. For example, the sun's image and reflection which are its radiance and manifestation, display the same identity on the sea's surface and in every drop of the sea. If the globe of the earth was composed of varying fragments of glass and exposed to the sun without veil, the sun's reflection would be the same in every fragment and on the whole face of the earth without obstruction or being divided into pieces 
or being diminished. If, let us suppose, the sun acted with will and through its will conferred the radiance of its light and image of its reflection, it would not be more difficult for it to confer its radiance on the whole surface of the earth than to confer it on a single particle. So the, I think the uh, imagery of things reflecting on the sea surface is one that we see a lot in Imam Nursi's writing. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense. So if I'm thinking of sunlight, and if you've been to any body of water recently, uh, you'll see that um, on each little bubble or foam on top of that water, there's a reflection of the light of the sun. So here, um, what I understand is that reflection showing up on a hundred thousand million billion bubbles doesn't take away from the sun's radiance, but it reflects on each of them um, without obstruction or without being divided into pieces or being diminished. Um, so this is one example where we can see that um, many things are being acted on without um, the source being diminished and also all of that reflection happening at the same time. Uh, Dr. Yamina, would you like to go comparison by comparison here or should we um, read all of them first? Maybe we can go through and then come back and see if there are questions or comments on it. It doesn't have to be a question. What do you understand from this? I mean, as you said, Nirvana, he uses this, uh, how do they, did he call them here? Transparency, reciprocity, balance, order, obedience. All these are as he called them, mystery, sir, mystery, secret, because it's really, we take them for granted, that's why. Otherwise, in themselves, they are really mysterious. We just take them for granted. And they are, they can be used as units of measurements to understand uh, matters that pertain to the unseen, that pertains to the creator, the divine, that are beyond our, what we take for granted, like our way of doing things. So we understand that it's beyond. The, the whole thing here, this understanding is not an understanding of pure, purely intellectual understanding because the intellect or reason is limited. So it has to be the heart. And as we have uh, read in the sixth word, reason, akal, is a tool of the heart. So we use it, we do, we reason, but we reason based on something. And that something it has to be from the heart as we are uh, taught in the Quran, otherwise it will be based on unconscious uh, beliefs that we have never questioned. But this mysteries like transparency and they really are like gates and windows onto a word that is not limited with what we imagine is like the limitation of solid matter. And it's really uh, worth
not trying, but striving to follow what's going on here. Why is he using these? Uh, they're not even like metaphors, but they are like tools to make something that is very far, make it close. Like, you know, you have a, a microscope or for something that is far, a telescope. All these laws are, can open doors to things that our heart, I wouldn't use the word understand, but can accept even if they are beyond our imagination because we cannot explain it, but much, much of our life is not an ex explainable. It's only uh, experiential, like uh, a tree coming out of uh, a seed, a fruit coming out of the tree, like Ziba was uh, uh, sharing with us. All these things, they are just experiential. There is nothing that explains this. And we need to become familiar with this and accept that this is our reality. And it is a wonderful reality because it, um, we start seeing exactly that's the Malekut. The Malekut points to first the meaning, and then there is more that meaning looks to, uh, to the beautiful names of God, to life, to things that cannot be contained in this uh, material, limited, transient, fleeting uh, world that we often get stuck in as if that's, that, that's what life is about. And deep down we know it's not, and that's why we feel something deeply missing in life and we can't find a true grounding or a true uh, purpose or true meaning. So let's carry on, inshallah. Bismillah. Second comparison. I have a question about this example. Like, uh, is the point of the example seeing the sun itself as a creation, and or is it about Allah's? Uh, like, uh, is it a metaphor or something, or is it directly to understand as such? To understand the relationship, he said at the beginning of this uh, third matter, divine powers relation is according to laws. So how does divine power work? It's relational. It doesn't do one thing and then another thing. And as I do uh, last week, um, Nurbanu was talking about the, the cheesecake. You make one and then two and then three. Uh, but here it's like you uh, say B and it is. There is one source of light and it uh, manifests or reflects in everything that has the ability to reflect light, for instance. So the light, the sunlight doesn't go and tries to reflect in things one by one. All at once, it happens because of the nature. And what we are interested in here is the relational uh, connection between them. So when uh, we start understanding what it is to create through Amr, divine command, kun, be, and it is. So we are looking here not at the be becoming a word, be, uh, becoming embodied, but more so at everything happens at once. Because here it's the... Um, it is looking to the comprehensiveness of divine power that we cannot grasp and because we cannot grasp and because everything is happening so easily so the ease this is explained in other places in the risale these themes are repeated but from different uh, aspects 
the is is either an indication to um, the absolute power, the comprehensiveness of the power. But when we are in a state of uh, heedlessness, we don't experience it as a sign of this power is all encompassing. So we take it for granted and as if it's, if it's so easy, it's almost like we don't see, we miss the, the, the power altogether. And that's why even uh, we are talking now about, uh, that's why lots of people actually totally reject divine power as if we don't need a, a maker, a creator. Look, it's happening so easily. It's happening on its own as if. But as far as we're concerned as believers, as Muslims, as students of the Quran, we have to be careful because we also may fall into that trap very easily. And although we claim one thing, we may live in a totally different way. Because remember that Iman is what we live by, not what we claim. So that's the test of integrity. And that's why we are supposed to learn and practice what we learn. And if we start practicing what we learn, then for instance, reflecting and staying with the awe at the power that is so comprehensive that it's happening so easily, we have to soak it in. We have to stay with it because otherwise it's very easy to forget it. So it's here, it's about how divine powers relation is according to laws. And what it means, he's giving all this, uh, I don't know if we can say metaphor because he's like a comparison. It's a comparison between, can you see how the sunlight reflects everywhere well now you can use this as a telescope to an unseen reality that divine power acts on everything at the same time inshallah that makes it clear So as we're reading the comparisons, we should look at them as telescopes and see where they point us, I guess. Second comparison, this concerns the mystery of reciprocity. For example, let us suppose there's a vast ring composed of living beings, that is of human beings, each holding a mirror. At its center, is an individual holding a candle. The radiance and manifestation reflected in all the mirrors surrounding the central point will be the same, and its relation will be without obstacle, fragmentation, or being diminished. I think for me, I have a hard time distinguishing this from the first one because I feel like we're looking at a similar concept. Um, there's someone in the middle and there's a circle or like a ring of people around this person and they're holding mirrors. And if the person in the middle is holding a candle or uh, source of light that is reflected in each of the mirrors that the people in the ring are holding. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm supposed to understand reciprocity here as different from transparency.
you want to comment, Dr. Amina? I mean, from one aspect, it is uh, similar. You just have, uh, we're looking at a different, sorry, we're looking at it from a different uh, perspective. The, in the first one, uh, just a second. I'm trying to find out what did he say for uh, Mukabela. Sirra. So the first one was the the fact that it is uh, how do you say reflecting Trans transparency is not really reflecting why did it say yeah shafaf yet in fact um so that everything is reflecting so the fact that things have have been created that have that uh, ability, things that are drop-like or glass-like or mirror-like are going to uh, reflect. So if they are, if they have that quality, they are going to reflect the light as it is. In the second one, it's not about, uh, it's already building on, it's reflecting, but at the same time, it's reflected, uh, the reflection will be the, the same, and its relation will be without obstacle, fragmentation, or being diminished. So he's building on it. There will be the, the fact that they all have a, a mirror, unless the mirror is one is bigger and one is smaller, actually the light comes as it is. It won't uh, reflect less light. It won't, there will be no fragmentation. Nothing will be, uh, so they all have the same relationship to the light in the center. So it's it's all about reflection, but it's uh, building on it. First, the fact that they are mirror-like, they are droplet-like, they have a reflective ability, and then the... How do you say? The distance, for instance, doesn't matter. They all reflect everything without any obstacle, fragmentation, or... So the first comparison is more about the nature of the things that are reflecting versus the second one the relationship between the two okay the their relationship with the source okay yeah i guess the the sun doesn't have a reflection the way it reflects on water, there's no similar reflection on a rock or a tree. So there's something in being mirror-like, drop-like, water-like, 
that allows for that radiance to reflect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Third comparison. This concerns the mystery of balance. For example, there are an enormous set of scales which are extremely accurate and sensitive. Whichever of two suns or two stars or two mountains or two eggs or two particles are placed in its two pans, it will require the same force to raise one pan of those huge sensitive scales to the sky and lower the other to the ground. I like this um this comparison. I'm not I'm not sure how to read it yet, but the imagery I think is great. So if you have a scale that's very accurate and sensitive and huge, that you can put two planets on each side, like a world and another world. And if you just add a grain of sand, it'll tip the scale. Versus if you just have two atoms and you add another atom, it'll tip the scale. So it doesn't matter how big the things are on the scale, as long as both sides are equal. Um, any well, the, amount of force. A tiny, a tiny thing can cause an imbalance. So is this, how should we... Okay, should I come back to it? I don't know. I feel like each one, I'm just like, oh, what's this a telescope for now? <laughs> um, like the example Sister Yamina gave us long back about, you know, the uh, wolf and that valley where I think there was some... I thought of exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, like how it can influence the whole... You know, ecosystem, you know, smallest thing. Anything, a tiny thing can cause a huge disturbance in the balance because it's so balanced, so well balanced that because the balance inclu here includes huge things, he's saying, or two eggs, like small or big, doesn't make any difference because you are. Um, well, we are talking about uh, disturbing the balance, but if it if it's it means there is a the mystery of the balance here is that it needs a huge power to keep all these things in balance, whether it's uh, two eggs or two mountains. For us, for two mountains, it takes a lot of uh, power, but two eggs, we take it for granted. But because it's a law. Okay, so there's two things. One, it's actually, not it's actually, but for us, because we see the eggs or smaller things easier to balance, we don't realize that the bigger the things that need to be balanced, the more absolute, not more absolute, but it needs more power. Um, so someone who can... It's because they are all interrelated and interconnected, in fact, the same power is needed for those small things. I It feels like I can bring like a, a scale, and of course, it's easy to weigh uh, two eggs, put an egg on, on each uh, side of the, of the scales. But that is happening because of uh, an order and a balance in the universe that I'm taking for granted. 
Right, because I don't, I don't take into consideration gravity, um, the continuation of the Earth, the um, solar system, the oxygen I'm breathing, all of those things. Like if for that very specific example, um, and anytime I think something is is small enough that I can balance it or control it, I'm actually taking for granted a lot of things around it. Uh, that need to happen for me to control that thing um and if we could if we could imagine like theoretically these huge scales with two mountains on each side and if those two mountains were exactly the same with this, exactly the same weight then a scale by definition they would be in balance and if we put a small egg on one side, it's going to spoil the balance. Mm. So the, the 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 whole key here is the fact that there is balance that we take for granted. And we actually actually using the balance, but we don't realize what it is. And this balance is related to order. Yeah, I feel like we only really understand it when we mess up the balance. <laughs> and then things uh, start to snowball. Uh, I'm going to keep reading on this. Anyone has any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, fourth comparison. This concerns the mystery of order. For example, a huge ship can be turned as easily as a tiny toy boat. Is the easily for us here? I don't think it's about us doing the turning, but when something happens and a huge boat ship is turned, like in a storm or something, it turns just the way uh, a toy ship turns. And sometimes we are, we can't believe it. Like how, how could this happen? I guess uh, when you think about those kinds of experiences, people also mention, like looking at it from afar, when they're looking at a tsunami or something, they're like, you know, the ships looked like boats because they're just coming in with the wave and turning or going upside down. And if you're watching it, um, it looks like that shouldn't be possible because those ships are normally huge um, but they seem so inconsequential in that sort of event fifth comparison this concerns the mystery of disengagedness for example a nature disengaged from individuality regards all particulars from the smallest to the greatest as the same and enters them without being diminished or fragmented. The qualities present in the aspect of external individuality do not interfere and cause confusion. They do not alter the view of a disengaged nature such as that. For example, a fish, like a needle, possesses such a disengaged nature the same as a whale, or a microbe bears an animal nature the same as a rhinoceros.
A nature disengaged from individuality regards all particulars from the smallest to the greatest as the same and enters them without being diminished or fragmented. I think our sister Yamina gives the example of water entering uh, each and every organism, plant, and acting as it should act according to their need. I think it's, uh, this, the field is the same example here. It doesn't change the amr. It acts as it's supposed to be acting in plant, in animal, and in human being. It doesn't act different. Like It acts according to the need of the yeah the water example is interesting we were talking about that over the weekend too in our um event at the dca i was thinking of this like maybe more abstract like um the idea of humanity is like um, Sarah's little baby is just as human as she is, just as human as Dr. Amina, just as human as my next door neighbor. Um, is it more abstract like that? I'm not sure. Here, the word nature is more like quiddity, mahia. Mm -hmm. It's not nature, like nature out there, tabia. Mm. I'll keep reading, unless anyone has comments it means the more there is uh, how do you say the less material let's say but here he's not talking he's talking about the shakhos disengage it's not easy to translate uh, disengage from individuality It, it like air the the more the more it is like that the less um, the more particulars and the, the small and great particular and universal won't matter for that thing for instance for air it's everywhere and it enters them without being diminished or fragmented so how should we understand the example of the microbe and the rhino or the fish and the whale a fish like a tiny fish and uh, a whale like the size just because it's tiny it doesn't make it less fish than the whale it doesn't um, what did he say here So is the idea like the essence of being a fish, fishness, let's say, is it's the same fishness for a better fish and the and the whale. Yeah, it's not only that it's going somewhere like air, but in itself, like the fishness is in everything in that tiny fish and it doesn't diminish because it's tiny. Mm. 
I'm trying to read from the from the original, but I can't say anything about the translation because if they ask me to translate it, I won't be able to. It's really difficult. Um, yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, I guess it's like. Um... So yeah, he's talking about Mahiet. So for instance, um, fishness is the mahia, is the quiddity of the fish. So he says, en küçüğünden en büyüğüne tenakus etmeden, from the tiniest to the biggest uh, fish, the fishness is the same. Let's say we are making up because of the example he gave. Tejessi etmeden bir bakar gider, girer. It doesn't get less because the the matter, the bodily matter or material body is uh, tiny or less than the other one. And it doesn't increase just because we increase in size, like from a child to an adult. Our humanity does not increase or decrease. I mean, because human being has free will, it's going to increase or decrease according to our uh, actions and our, but we're talking about like uh, being human. Yeah, just because someone is taller, let's say, it doesn't mean they're more human. <laughs> yeah. And something from outside, you acquire something from outside is not going to, does not interfere with that quiddity, with, for instance, you being a human. Yeah, they always, you know, make the joke, for example, if you eat a lot of something, you'll become that thing. If you eat, if you eat a lot of watermelon or something, <laughs> you'll become part watermelon, but you don't, you don't lose any of the humanness because of external things. But that would be common sense if we had not experienced something different. Common sense would say, if you eat only watermelon, like logically, it seems there is no logic because logic is always based on our uh, observations. Hmm. And the logic that is not based on an observation, like two plus two equals four, that's also from observation because we decided to call this four and to call this two and two. And just like we have uh, the words two, we have symbols in maths, and that's only to make, uh, they are references to make things uh, easier to not only articulate, but express and also work with. But in if it's pure math, which means pure uh, a priori, something that I can work on intellectually reasoning without referring to outside, then there is no new information. It's just based on saying something that we already know. Anything new? I have to refer to the word out there. And in the word out there, there is no, I am in learning from what I'm seeing, not the other way around. So normally, because we see, like if you put lots of watermelon, it's going to be a pile of watermelon, but it doesn't work like that once you eat it. You can, if you have an animal, for instance, and you feed them, for instance, a cow or a sheep. They eat grass all the time, but they are not grass. Mm -hmm. So he says at the end, bir mikrop, bir gergedan gibi mahiyeti hayvaniyeyi taşıyor. So that mahiyet, that nature, is the animal nature, for instance, does not change.
Yeah, I think in one of the previous sessions we had talked about um how we shouldn't rely so much on our um like uh intellectual reasoning to make sense of the world because if you had shown someone who had never learned before or who had never seen before a tree and you just showed them a branch and you said, what do you think comes out of this? They would never in a million years guess that um, these tiny uh, balls of sugar that is super watery come out comes out of the branch so <laughs> um yeah when we think of yeah the chickens eat bugs they don't become bugs i eat watermelon i don't become watermelon it seems funny to say that <laughs> but um that sort of logic is what i'm using for most of my life um there are things that I have just gotten used to that I should start questioning. We're How taking can... the miracles for granted. Those are miracles of power that we are witnessing day in, day out, all the time. And we are so, like, we take them so much for granted that we are not amazed. We're not even surprised because we think, of course, I know. We give them names, as it says in the Quran. Just because we name them doesn't mean that it is less miracle. Yeah, like call it digestion. <laughs> and then poof, watermelon becomes energy. But well, how? <laughs> how? How did that happen? Um, yeah. Sixth comparison. This demonstrates this demonstrates the mystery of obedience. For example, a commander causes a single private to advance with the command forward march, the same as he causes an army to advance. The truth of the mystery of this comparison about obedience is as follows. As is proved by experience, everything in the universe has a point of perfection, and everything has an inclination towards that point. Increased inclination becomes need, increased need becomes desire, increased desire becomes attraction, and attraction, desire, need and inclination are each seeds and kernels which together work with the essence of things conform to the creative commands of almighty god the absolute perfection of the true nature of contingent beings is absolute existence their particular perfections are an existence peculiar to each which makes each being's abilities emerge from the potential to the actual. Thus, the obedience of the whole universe to the divine command B is the same as that of a particle, which is like a single soldier, contained all together in the obedience and conformity of contingent beings to the pre-eternal command of B, proceeding from the pre-eternal will, are inclination, need, desire, and attraction, which are also manifestations of divine will. The fact that when subtle water receives the command to freeze, with a refined inclination it may split a piece of iron, demonstrates the strength of the mystery of obedience. If these six comparisons are observed in the potentialities and actions of contingent beings, which are both defective and finite and weak and have no actual effect, 
without doubt, it will be seen that everything is equal in relation to pre-eternal power, which is both pre-eternal and post-eternal, and creates the whole universe out of pure non-existence, and being manifested through the works of its tremendousness, leaves all minds in wonderment. Nothing at all can be difficult for it. Such a power cannot be weighed on the small scales of these mysteries, neither are they proportionate. They have been mentioned to bring the subject closer to the understanding and to dispel any doubts. So the this uh, desire attraction um, need inclination we all, we talked about previously in the twenty ninth word if you guys remember um, but two things stood out to me here again we have this. Um, one thing versus uh, many things comparison so a commander can say march and it has the same effect on a single soldier versus a whole army they both advanced and then here um, everything in the universe has a point of perfection and everything has an inclination towards that point Increased inclination becomes need. Increased need becomes desire. And increased desire becomes attraction. And all of these things together with the essences of things conform to the creative commands of Almighty God. Okay, then the absolute perfection of the true nature of contingent beings is absolute existence. So contingent being is like us. Um, our existence is not necessary, right? So one way that we have been describing our creator is to say, you know, his existence is necessary. Wajibun wujud, I guess. Go ahead, Dr. Amina. Did you want to say something? No, no, it was a mistake. Um, so what I understand from here, and you know, going back to the resurrection bit, um, if everything in the universe has a point of perfection and is you know inclined towards that point, perfection for something like us who are contingent would be absolute existence. So going from um, being contingently existent to being absolutely existent, I guess. Um, and then their particular perfections are an existence peculiar to each which makes each being's abilities emerge from the potential to the actual. So we have two kinds of perfection, absolute perfection, particular perfection. Okay, so maybe it's like this. There's a difference between existing and non-existent. And if you're something that doesn't exist yet, perfection, absolute perfection would be to actually exist. Then when you exist, according to what kind of being you are, you have particular perfections. So for um, a human being, that perfection looks different uh, than for a cat, than for a plant. Um, and they have these potentials which um, emerge into the actual. 
Okay, thus the obedience of the whole universe to the divine command B, Kun, is the same as that of a particle, which is like a single soldier. Contained altogether in the obedience and conformity of contingent beings, obedience and conformity of contingent beings to the preternal command of B, proceeding from the preternal will, are inclination, need, desire, and attraction, which are also manifestations of divine divine will. The fact that when subtle water receives the command to freeze. With a refined inclination, it may split a piece of iron, demonstrates the strength of the mystery of obedience. I think this sixth comparison needs to be contemplated on. It's very important. All the others where to build on this because if he started with this one we would not so the other four comparisons were to prepare us for this what does it mean that they are all obedient something that is recurrent in the quran that everything obeys the command of god so here for instance we since we talked about the watermelon when we see a watermelon seed, we know that this is a potential watermelon. And we know through experience, through observation, that if you want to have a watermelon, you have to follow the steps. And those steps is to sow the seed and the seed has an inclination to be a, a shoot, and then there will be leaves, and then uh, flowers. Uh, I had thrown some uh, melon seeds together with the melon uh, uh, how do you call it? The skin and everything uh, in the earth to make it a little bit was too clay so i was throwing all everything in it but it's not like a compost uh thing i just throw it ex immediately and just cover it with a little bit of uh, earth and some of those seeds grow and mm -hmm. now those And now there are these yellow uh, flowers. So it has this inclination. You feel like a need. It's expensive. It's invading, invading everywhere. It has a desire to become something. That's how we view it. And it is an interpretation. Like it wants to be. It's, it's created to be a melon, to be a watermelon or if it's a seed for the flower to be this and that flower. And, um, and so he says the, uh, the perfection, the absolute perfection of the true nature of contingent beings, contingent beings, we talked about it before. Uh, it's as Nuban was saying, the God is necessary being, he is, um, Existence is necessary. Without him, there is nothing. But any one of us or anything that is, whether I'm here or not, it's contingent because before me, everything existed. After me, it will exist. If God uh, wills it to exist this way. And even like we can say, but the sun is uh, different. Without the sun, everything will be, will Live, yeah, this kind of creation will want to be here, but uh, it doesn't mean there will be no no creation. So they are all contingent. Their existence 
and uh, non-existence is equal. There is nothing that requires them to be in themselves. So there, the, the, true, the absolute perfection of the true nature of such being, including ourselves, it means all created beings, is absolute existence. And we, it's to be, to exist. That's the perfection. But this perfect existence is not contingent, transient existence. And that absolute existence can only be through our connection to the true, the source of all existence. So the, uh, in a way we can reread the four comparisons as ways to understand how everything obeys the divine command of be. Be and everything is. And we see it as also in there uh, as a, a dynamic. We see the be in a dynamic process. They are, everything is going, there is robobia. Everything is um, being perfected from a seed to a, a watermelon with the seeds in it and a watermelon that it, it uh, expresses the divine power and the other beautiful names of God much more clearly than the seed. The seed on its own, if it was not in connection with the plant, with the flowering plant, with the growing fruit, it wouldn't mean anything. So it's all in there, that um, process, that is speaking of uh, glorifying the beautiful names of God. And that's how they are attaining uh, absolute perfection. Because although, as we are told in the Quran, the, the material side, the mulk side is perish, perishing, will perish, is perishing, the Malakut side, the side that looks to the meaning that they are uh, embodying looks to something uh, eternal. And this is also very important for us to understand because we are the only uh, beings or creatures that when we don't understand and or we don't surrender to this uh, process willingly we understand and choose to and choose and therefore intend to surrender willingly we uh, first we we feel like we're struggling there is no ease there's no all flow in our life we feel unfulfilled and even if we find our a true desire, we will feel unfulfilled because it is not uh, connected to a lasting uh, source, a lasting purpose. And often we don't even find that true uh, desire because we may be misreading through the ego. We are feeling a need, but then we misinterpret it because we are so focused on uh, the worldly so here when he says this inclination increased inclination becomes need need becomes desire becomes attraction this this includes human beings and it's very important for us to be aware of what's going on within us. And instead of either struggling and fighting with those things or embracing them, but uh, trying to fulfill them ourselves, if we learn to 
surrender and fall and and listen and follow the, the we can call it the guidance or we will be taken step by step it reminds me of uh, the story of uh, Yusuf salam how he's just following it feels almost like he's passive but he's at important breakthroughs he's very very active but he's not active uh, he's not pursuing something obstinately he is waiting to be guided to be inspired and once because he has that awareness when something comes clearly it is coming by divine will then when the the king offers him the position he puts his conditions he's not like oh uh, i was in uh, he he was in prison now he's just happy to be out and he is given a position i will accept your position with all your condition just take me out of here no he comes i'll come out when you accept my conditions because he's totally aware that everything is happening by divine will. And that's why in, in Surah Yusuf, Surah 12, repeatedly we are told how he is a muhsin, someone who lives in the presence of God, who is aware that whatever is happening right now is happening by divine will. So when he lives in that dimension, let's say, from that from the ruh, he he's in calm, he's in direct contact, he's perceiving the malakut directly. So the he is not stuck in the mulk. The mulk is the, the realm of contrast, the realm of opposites, the realm, because that's how we it's the contrast that are the signs, the ayat that guide us beyond to the malakut. So I feel that this sixth one is something that I personally will need to reread and listen to and wait for it to unfold, inshallah, because it, it's easier to understand it as when it, um, we're talking about other uh, creations, other beings, but how does it apply to me? Because sometimes, a lot of times, we are not in a state of conscious obedience. We need to be consciously make the decision to obey the divine command. Inshallah. What you shared about Yusuf alayhi salam, that was very beautiful and helped things come together for me. Because he was um, aware of this, the mystery of, um, I'm not sure which, exactly which one it is, but the truth of existence unfolding around him, the mystery of be and it is. The patience was such an active internal process until, um, like you said about, you know, not leaving until his conditions were followed. And it, it reminded me of the sensitive balance, the extremely accurate and ex extremely sensitive balance, because most of us, including myself, act from haste and react from haste and completely disrupt the balance. And um, that huge disturbance of the balance is so evident in all of the resistance that you feel, or like you said, everything that you just said. Of, and it's all because we are not doing 
what we were made to do. We were not, you know, we're not using the faculty to really discover the truth about how things are made. And it, first and foremost, um, you know, in ourselves and in, in the immediate sphere, in our homes and things like that, I think it's it's easier to look at the tree or the ocean and, and really reflect on the incredible, you know, awe and the mystery of be and balance and perfection, um, transparency, you know, and to really see like, wow, like this is, you can, you know, I feel like those messages become more clear, but I, perhaps because we, and I loved Yusuf's example, alayhi salam, we, we do react from so much haste and, um, you know, building on what we talked about at the end of last week, you know, forgetting that our feelings are also part of his mulk, dis, yani, completely disrupts the balance. That's a huge disturbance of the balance when you forget that your feelings are part of the mulk. Um, and that we should pause and read them instead of hastily react from them and then which disturbs the balance even more so this is a good homework to pause with to uh slow down read it again and then inshallah we can share our reflections in the contemplation group inshallah So we'll stop there. If anyone has any comments, feel free to type them up in chat or raise any comments. So we'll reflect on the sixth comparison and um, come back with reflections next week. Um, as we are ending July, um, we had our first session at the Dianet Center in Maryland, uh, Living the Quran. Uh, our first session was about um, the inner transformation um, of living, of living, Bismillah. So our next one will be at the end of August, inshallah, the 31st. Um, if you guys are in the area or would like to trek please come out. Uh, we would love to have you. And for um, anyone who can make a commitment, uh, let us know and we can maybe do some um, task sharing <laughs> and volunteering since um, we have a reasonable turnout and um, we can do a bit more uh, organizing behind the scenes, inshallah. Okay, um, so we'll stop there. سبحانك لا إلم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الأليم الحكيم آخر دعواكم الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة على رسولنا صلوات